Uh, as I was saying on the car on the way over it, this is not actually the first time I've been to Nashville, um, but the uh, last time was um, somewhat uh, briefer because I um, didn't actually stop. I was on my way from Chapel Hill to um, the Grand Canyon, and, um, and we managed to do it in three days, but uh, as you can imagine, we didn't have to, too much time to stop. Um, well, I met Sten um, very briefly last night, which was a, uh, um, a delight, as always, um, and I was uh, disappointed that um, I wasn't able to show him this slide because he is um, a great uh, fan of um, Scotland and the Highlands, and the, this is uh, taken from just above the house that I have on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and the, um, the, the reason I wanted to show it to him is because this little community um, is uh, an, known as Toshkeg, and that is a um, Viking um, name. Um, it's Old Norse, and it stands for Cod Bay um, in uh, Old Norse. So um, that's what uh, the link for especially for Sten, that I'll have to send in the slide. So I'm going to be um, talking about um, transmission networks uh, of HIV and what uh, we can um, infer from now from uh, studies of HIV sequences. And um, as Rich said, this is something which I've been working on for um, a little while now. Um, and it was, in fact, about 20 years ago that I started working on um, uh, the evolution of HIV in, um, patient, it, within communities of patients and group, groups of patients. The context that I will be setting my uh, um, uh, talk in is, is um, the sexual uh, contact network um, concept, um, which, of course, is... Uh, preeminent in, in um, studies of sexually transmitted infections, um, of the, the, their epidemiology, because the, um, the, uh, their, uh, the epidemics are limited by the sexual contact network. The, this is an example of such a very famous example of a um, contact network which was um, uh, obtained from interview data and um, displays the um, contacts of um, an American high school not energetic high school as far as I can see. The contact networks are typically reconstructed by um, interview data. Uh, the interview data um, usually take the form of a uh, number of sexual contacts in the, um, uh, their gender and even their identity, if this is, is possible to do that. Um, and the, um, in, within typically within the last year of the interview. Um, there's practical reasons for that, because generally it's, uh, if it's felt that going um, uh, further out in time um, is unreliable, and um, shorter periods of time you don't collect enough um, events. So it's extremely useful in many um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, this is an example um, taken from a study of gonorrhea. In HIV, we have um, additional information f because, um, as an RNA virus, it evolves extremely rapidly, and um, it actually the, the viral sequence changes within the, f the time frame that um, sexual contact networks evolve. The, we can therefore compare the phylogeny, the, 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 the virus, uh, of, of virus evolution, with the contact network, and this has been done on. Um, However, those comparisons have led to uh, rather puzzling results. And in more than one case, it's been found that the viral phylogeny completely fails to um, recover the sexual contact network. This was a study that we were involved with um, based in the uh, Masaka district of Uganda uh, many years ago now. It was ba um, and there was a very detailed information on the sexual contact network that had been established um, by the, um, uh, Uganda co the colleagues in Uganda at the MRC unit um, in Entebbe. And when we performed um, the viral phylogenies on the individuals who, the um, virus from the ind individuals in those, that contact network, we discovered that in fact the virus phylogenies um, completely failed to recover the contact network and in several cases, um, such as uh, this, this was um, this is a particularly extreme example where um, two uh, partners, uh, members of a couple, were 
um, uh, found to be infected with different subtypes of HIVs. So clearly they did not um, transmit to each other. And this applied across the, uh, in, in um, less strikingly, but across that um, entire uh, network. That, um, that result was um, confirmed by um, uh, a group working in um, Cuba on um, another contact net network uh, more, using more modern um, technology. The uh, techniques had moved on about te uh, in the, the ten, intervening 10 years. And they, but they came to the same conclusion, that they could not recover the sexual contact network from the virus phylogeny. There was a, there was a really significant mismatch. So um, why do we think there is such a mismatch? Well, there are two um, uh, fairly obvious um, features to anybody who knows anything about HIV. And one is that um, clearly there's a long period of infection and um, uh, transmission can occur at any point during that long period, provided that um, uh, individual is not, the HIV positive individual is not on um, uh, antiretroviral therapy. The, there is also, as, as we know, a relatively low average risk of um, uh, transmission per contact. And those two together are going to mean that, that um, the uh, information that one obtains within the last year may not be as relevant as it is in the context of other STIs. In addition, for some groups, um, you have uh, very complex networks and um, you have uh, significant numbers of anonymous contacts. So, so the, these are going to make it much more difficult to recover um, the relevant sexual contact network. So what we've been trying to do is to um, obtain um, more detailed information using uh, the, the virus phylogeny approach in order to um, uh, get at this question what the transmission network is for HIV in um, a community. The, what gives us the opportunity to do this is that in um, recent years there have been uh, new uh, phylogenetic methods um, obtained uh, and, and developed with um, a much firmer statistical basis than, than um, were available in the past. They allow us to include sample date information and actually put a time frame, an absolute time frame on the um, transmission uh, network. And in addition, and critical for the, this, it turns out, there are the opportunity um, f uh, is presented because we have extremely dense sampling now of infected um, communities uh, arising from uh, the uh, routine uh, clinical treatment where um, before an individual goes on antiretroviral therapy, then almost universally a, um, in, in the developed world, uh, a, um, an HIV genotype will be obtained um, to rule out uh, transmission of um, drug-resistant virus. And it's this dense sampling that in increases our chances of recovering um, the um, transmission networks. So now we're able to estimate both the structure and the dynamics of the HIV transmission network from um, the analysis of uh, viral sequences. The um, data that I will be talking about have all um, been obtained um, through, as I said, through, as a result of a routine clinical care, um, and they um, are uh, available through um, a large collaboration of clinical centres throughout the UK, um, which um, contri basically contribute the um, uh, HIV genotypes on all patients um, for whom who go on therapy um, within the UK. And um, this um, uh, database um, was set up as a collaboration um, initiated by uh, Dean and Pele back in um, oh, 1997, I think it was, and um, has um, been uh, building ever, ever since. And is now actually that slide slightly old, that's now up to 60,000 sequences um, from several times, multiple sequences from the, from, um, the same individual. But as you'll see, very large numbers of individuals. The nature of the data, um, fairly uh, classical for, for um, HIV treatment with um, the, um, because uh, it's um, quite been uh, collected for, for a long time, we, um, we uh, restrict ourselves to the uh, largest um, body of data, which is, um, means that actually the smallest part of the sequence, which is about 1,200 bases of the um, pole gene that um, encodes protease and um, the first uh, 900 bases of, of um, 
reverse transcriptase. Now, how do we um, uh, take this um, forward to um, identify the um, transmission pattern? How do we identify clusters in, this, um, in the network? Well, we'll start with the, the most straightforward um, approach, which is obviously where we um, initiated, and um, which has certainly um, been applied in um, a variety of other um, uh, groups as well. First, we'll simply count the number of differences between um, sequences uh, taken from in, um, all individuals in, in our um, database. And then if we do, and then we'll look at, in order to look at, uh, um, because we're interested in transmission, we'll look at the smallest distances between those. Um, uh, if we do that, then what we s calculate those distances, then what we see expressed as a heat map is, is something like this. We get, typically, we have, um, because within the UK, we have multiple subtypes of, of HIV. And um, we get two big um, centers of um, genetic distance, which are these out here, they're between subtypes. And these are um, pairwise comparisons within subtypes. But then of interest for transmission, we have this little cluster down here, very, very closely related sequences um, down here. And those are the ones um, we uh, obviously will be of interest to us um, in the context of transmission. Now, continuing with this approach where we look at the um, genetic distance between um, the sequences in order to identify patterns of um, transmission, then that leads us into um, in these uh, interesting uh, patterns, as I said, which are um, almost artistic in their um, presentation. My um, postdoc was getting a bit carried away, I think, at times. Um, the <coughs> The critical point being that each of these uh, clusters that was identified lies within, um, all the sequences lie within a certain um, uh, genetic distance from uh, the other sequences indicated by a color. And so if you use different um, thresholds, then um, the, all of these groups were identified by this threshold of 4.8% um, genetic distance, but then moving that up did not actually increase most of them very much. And they, um, in this particular um, sample. And as you see, you got a few more onto this one. You didn't get any, any more at all onto this one. You had just at the, added one onto, onto that one. So you can identify clusters using this approach of genetic distance, which is used, in, as I said, in a number of other um, areas. And they seem another, um, another cohorts and, and groups. And they do seem to be robust to the threshold that you use. But that's not um, a, that's, that's an, an arbitrary approach. Um, it doesn't have any particular connection with the dynamics of transmission. And um, so we um, have been keen to um, push the uh, analysis much further than this in order to try, try and um, get into the area which where we can interpret transmission patterns. So we start by um, improving the, uh, this genetic characterization. And we use, um, to do that, we start by using um, a um, Bayesian um, phylogenetic approach, which gives us uh, much greater confidence that the, the links that we identify between the individuals are um, real. They're not artifacts of a particular, that particular um, cutoff that we imposed. And this is what, when we, when we do this, we, we can reconstruct these um, phylogenetic trees, and they show that, um, yes, you, you can really identify um, patient clusters here that are really some very tight indeed, and um, they, don't, they have um, very distinct from, these, um, uh, from the background sequences. So we can identify these um, in this, uh, as uh, very real clusters using the, um, this approach as well. And the two map, so we get um, the same clusters identified using either approach, which is um, obviously uh, satisfactory. But that allows us now to um, then describe the structure of the epidemic in this particular group. We, um, and um, th this um, was uh, something, that we, just to summarize the, the, these results, it showed us that within, um, within this group, 
which was subtype B, and therefore um, almost exclusively within um, the UK, that means um, transmitted amongst MSM. And the, um, we see a very highly skewed distribution where 20% given that of those individuals who had a link to one other in the, in the data set, at, um, then 20% were linked only to one other. 25%, however, were in large clusters of um, size greater than 10. So this is 25% of the patients had, were in clusters that were 10 or greater. For this group, it meant the same thing. And this, um, we, this observation we published in a um, uh, couple, couple of years ago now, it was based on um, the largest clinic in um, London. It was a sing single clinic study. The, that distribution, that very large uh, um, long tail, is, um, as you'll see, has um, some interesting consequences and, and is quite um, uh, well known from studies of sexual contact networks. We extended that work, again, still with the same approach, but into the non-B subtypes um, circulating in HIV. And the, here um, we have a different patient group. Non-B subtypes are relatively recent um, arrivals in the UK. Obviously, we've had um, subtype B since um, the early uh, 1980s. Um, and, uh, but uh, non-B subtypes predominantly started to arrive in, um, from 1995 onwards. Uh, they're mostly associated with um, immigration from sub-Saharan Africa. And the two most common are su uh, subtype C and subtype A. And when we looked, performing the same analysis, looking at the distribution of cluster size in these two subtypes, we have a same type of distribution with, um, but rather more um, with just one link and um, rather um, somewhat fewer in the um, longer um, tail. And if you look at those two together, then this is uh, what we see from those. The proportion of patients in um, uh, clus large clusters for subtype C and subtype A, or subtype C was si um, about 6%, subtype A um, was 14%, subtype B was 25%. So substantially more in the, um, um, amongst the um, known MSM subtype B. Most of the um, non-B subtypes are associated with uh, heterosexual transmission. Just recently, um, we've been able to add to um, this analysis uh, with um, some data released by the um, HPA that we didn't have before that shows that, in fact, some of these large clusters, these non-B um, subtype large clusters, are actually uh, crossovers into MSM. And um, so we would actually take out a couple of those, and that would enhance the difference between these two um, patterns that we are seen in um, the uh, non-B subtypes and um, the, in terms of the length of the tail and the uh, subtypes B. So we now know that some of those non-B uh, non subtypes have actually crossed over. So the epidemic um, clearly in the UK is still um, uh, continues to evolve and um, is changing. It's done it, um, quite um, noticeably. Now, the we have, as I said, that those results based on MSM were based on um, the large data that's been published on the largest clinic um, in um, London and um, were based on a study of about 5,000 um, individuals. We've since then extended that to the, um, a study of the entire UK uh, population. And the, as I said, this database now has um, extended the, the, the UK. We now have um, completed analysis based on um, 14,500 um, in HIV infected individuals, which, as this uh, related to the um, 2007 um, release of, the, of this um, database, was a, um, corresponded to about two thirds of the infected MSM known uh, diagnosed in the UK at that time. We found, using the same approach as I've described, 
50% uh, of those had a link to at least one other using that um, the threshold of 4.5%, um, slightly more um, re uh, restricted than, than I said before. Of those, we were able to show that um, using uh, a bootstrap neighbor joining tree, because it's given the size, the size of the sequen um, sequence data set, that's, that's um, as far as one could take it, um, nearly 6,000 could um, have, uh, be shown to have resolvable um, links and we've taken all of those 6,000 into our cluster size analysis. So now looking at that um, data set, uh, this is the pattern. We've got um, two axes here um, because of the, the um, scale. Um, so we now have a uh, blue axis is for the small uh, number of links co coming down here. And we see that, um, again, so that of um, very significant proportion, in fact this as you'll see about 25% um, uh, of the patients are in the group where, it, where they only have one, a link with one other individual. And then again on this axis you see that a very smaller number of clusters but with very large numbers of patients in them. So we have a cluster now um, with 106 individuals in it. We have one with um, uh, 68 individuals in it and um, a smaller, uh, slightly smaller groups as well. So as we expand the data set for the, to the entire UK, the clusters we're identifying are extreme, um, have grown uh, substantially larger. So overall, 30% linked to only one other, 40% linked to between two and 10 others, and then nearly 30% linked to more than 10 others amongst MSM in the UK. Again. Because it's subtype B, we know these are, there's hardly, hardly any found in any, um, associated with heterosexual infections. And, and uh, there, there are very little with um, injection drug use. So that's the structure um, we have identified. We know the distribution of cluster size. Now, to link to the transmission patterns we need to add the um, fourth dimension, and um, that means, in um, the parlance of um, uh, um, an evolutionist, we need to add what we call the molecular clock. That's um, not a trivial um, task, because the first thing that you find when you um, say, OK, well, we'll say all these sequences are evolving at the same rate, and we're going to then um, use the date information and say when these transmissions occurred, is that, in fact, they're not all evolving at the same rate. And that's been well established. However, recently, it's been um, more sophisticated approaches to the concept of the molecular clock have been developed, which allow us to estimate the rate of evolution within the tree at, at, um, and allow it to vary across the tree. So we're using the data to estimate the rate at which the sequence changes in different, and allowing it to be at different uh, rates in different parts of the tree. And then we fit that um, to back to the tree. And this is what's called a relaxed clock. If you allow the clock rate to vary across the tree. And this fits quite well to um, what HIV does in, um, when it's transmitted. So here, what we're doing is that as we've taken, taken our clusters, we've um, constructed our trees of viruses, one, one from each patient. And now, we're putting a time frame of years on, on that. And more than that, we're actually then estimating the um, uh, posterior probability, that's terminology because it's a Bayesian uh, um, statistics that's, that, that underlies this, of each, that each of these nodes, these trans, um, which are, um, occurred at a particular point in time. And this um, indicates that in the way in which the um, uh, confidence in the dating of these nodes um, goes is that the more recent they, they are, that is, the closer they are to the calibration points, which is, in, the, in these cases, the date at which the sample was taken, then the higher our confidence that those nodes occurred at that particular time, point in time. As we go further back in the tree, then the, um, our confidence and in terms of the particular time it occurred becomes much um, weaker. So for, from our purpose, for our purposes, this is excellent because I'm interested in very recent events and I want to know 
um, how confident I can be in, in the dating of those events. Well, because they're close to the timing of the calibration points, the, it's actually very, um, our confidence is very good. Of course, if we're interested in the origin of HIV or the origin of um, the M, sub, the M sub, uh, group or um, even the origin of subtypes, then we're back in this realm where our confidence of any particular time point is um, much less. But I'm not. At least I'm not interested in doing it myself. There's plenty of other people do, doing that. The, so this is, um, approach this, uh, uh, the, um, was introduced by um, Alexei Drummond and my colleague Andrew Rambo. And um, the, uh, so this gives us a um, statistical um, basis for uh, validity for carrying out these analyses. With this, we see um, a time-scaled tree with um, a, uh, uh, for example, here's a 13-patient cluster. Allow, we can put dates on, them, on these um, uh, nodes in, in the tree. And as each patient contributes only one sequence, it's the sequence before they went on therapy, then every time that tree splits, it reflects a transmission event because it means that the, vir the, gu the virus um, has to go into different patients. So that tracks transmission events. So the closer together those splits occur, the closer together the transmission events had to be. So we'll, what we do is calculate the distribution of transmission intervals, the times between those um, uh, events in the, in the clusters. Now this is um, conservative because individuals, HIV positive individuals that um, we have, have been missed in the sampling, perhaps because they're not diagnosed or weren't included in, in the clinic or whatever, they would make the intervals shorter. And so, um, as you'll see, that um, means that our, our conclusions are conservative. The results for our initial study for the um, subtype B in MSM in, in, in the large clinic were really striking because the median was, uh, was 14 months across that, um, all the, the clusters, so all the sequences in the clusters, the median um, uh, transmission interval was 14 months, estimated in this way. And 25% of them occurred with, um, were six months or shorter. And that's a very, very significant given a, an infection which is up to 10 years. And uh, the, you know, if you one um, talks to infectious disease epidemiologists such as um, Roy Anderson, um, which I do sometimes, um, the, um, the view has been that um, the initial periods of infection are relatively unimportant and, and the long period uh, duration of um, uh, infection is much more important for um, HIV uh, dynamics in, in, the, in the community. Now, it's not like that for all um, uh, risk groups. When we looked at the um, sub subtypes A and C, then we found both a longer median in their clusters and hardly any transmitted within six months. So if we compare those two then, um, uh, uh, above the other, then this is, this is what we've seen. The um, distribution is similar, but the median for subtype B is shorter. The proportion of, an, tra of transmission into node intervals, as we call them, of less than six months is um, substantially higher for um, subtype B, the MSM population, than it is for um, the non-Bs. So we can clearly see that the dynamics of transmission in these two groups in the UK differs very substantially. So, just to, sure. So, do you uh, suspect that the A's and C's are transmitted by injection drug use? What's the... Most, most of them are heterosexual. What we found, as I said, we didn't have... Uh, we found recently that um, some of the larger clusters are associated with um, uh, some injection drug use and some MSM, but most of them are heterosexual. So just to summarize um, what I've been saying about transmission within clusters, um, we showed that um, for subtype B, 25% were associated with um, one or more others uh, at the um, 
cutoffs that we used, 25% of those belong to clusters of more than eight individuals. And in, those indiv in that group, 25% of the intertransmission, those transmission intervals was estimated to be less than six months, suggesting high contact rates and also um, that acute infection, that period in, uh, of up to the first um, couple of months where um, viral loads are particularly high, um, may be associated with um, transmission risk, elevating transmission risk um, amongst MSM, uh, which is, we published in um, PLOS Medicine a couple of years ago now. Whereas if we look at the, um, concentrating on subtype C because, um, because it was the, la the larger group, then 6% were in the large clusters, 2% of individuals were in clusters um, of um, uh, up to six months, showing that in contrast, acute infection was um, very probably not a driver in this group, which is, as I was just saying, said, predominantly um, heterosexually tra transmitted. I think that's your cue to um, 